President Tony Tan Keng Yam, Mr. Gurmit Singh, President of the Interreligious Organization, Habib Said Hassan Alatas, Organizing Chairman and recipient of the IRO Award for this year, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to be able to host you to dinner on your 66th anniversary, which is also our 50th anniversary as a nation, and to do it here in the Istana. We were supposed to do this in March, but we had to postpone it because Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was then very ill in hospital. And I thank you for your understanding. I would also like to thank you for your words of comfort and prayers for Mr. Lee and for the family during that difficult time. Ms. Lee would have appreciated members of different faiths coming together in this way because the multiracial and multireligious society was a fundamental founding ideal upon which he built this nation. As we celebrate SG50, we should remind ourselves that religious harmony is a precious legacy that we must treasure. The IRO symbolizes this ideal of religious harmony. You show that we can transcend our differences. You offer a platform for members of different faiths to learn about one another through interfaith dialogues and to do good together through interfaith charity projects. We've come a long way since 1949 when the IRO was established and when even the idea that members of different faiths should meet and work together was novel. So we'd like to thank the IRO's pioneers and the generations of leaders that came after them. Through the efforts of groups like yours, we have strengthened our religious harmony over the years. Singaporeans appreciate the importance of religious, of religious harmony. Our religious leaders understand our overriding national interest in living harmoniously and peacefully with one another. And often they celebrate each other's festivals together. They've built up mutual trust. They can engage candidly and honestly, even on delicate matters, and so together discuss and work out sensitive issues that are bound to arise from time to time. Whether it's sharing with one another on potentially serious problems which affect us all, as we recently did in a briefing to religious and community leaders on the threat of self-radicalization and ISIS, or mediating private issues and conflicts between different groups, such as the use of void decks for funeral rites, or even more sensitively, which funeral rites to follow when someone has converted to one faith from one faith to another and passed away. Or managing public issues like the wearing of religious symbols, crucifixes or the tudong, or the conduct of festivals like taipusam. With an attitude of mutual compromise and give and take, we've been able to manage differences and further strengthen trust, openness and unity among many religious groups all in Singapore. Indeed, we've done so well that some people suggest that for us, religion is no longer a sensitive no-go area. They argue that our society, and in particular our government, is overly sensitive on matters of race and religion, that the state intervenes too much and too readily to circumscribe personal freedoms and liberty in the name of racial and religious harmony, and that we should now allow unfettered discussions or even criticisms and blasphemies on matters of race religion in the name of freedom of speech. And perhaps the IRO can now honorably retire. <laughs> I think these assumptions are quite unrealistic. Yes, we have become more mature and open in our dialogue. Yes, we can now speak about subjects which 20 years ago would have been hard to raise at all, especially in public. But this doesn't mean that we don't have to be sensitive and respectful or to worry about actions that provoke and give offence. Look at other societies. Even in countries where different groups have lived together for centuries, 
race and religious, religion still remain sensitive issues, which can be stirred up and can explode. In Sri Lanka, Buddhists, Hindus and Muslims have had a long history of peaceful coexistence. But after the country became an independent state in 1949, it has been riven by ethnic and religious tensions and conflicts, first between the majority Buddhists and the Hindu Tamil minority, and then also between the Buddhists and the Muslims. In France, a much older society than Singapore, after the Charlie Hebdo killings by a French ISIS supporter, anti-Muslim sentiments rose and mosques were attacked and defaced. In the US, race has never stopped being a sensitive issue. Recently, with the, death, with the deaths of several black youths in different cities, often after some encounter with the police, tensions have erupted into violence, and there were especially bad riots in Baltimore, Maryland. These external events aren't just examples of what can happen to us, but also influences on our multiracial and multi-religious society. For example, just to cite a few more, which have more direct impact on us. In the Middle East, ISIS is causing people in many countries to become radicalized and to try to join them, or to carry out violent attacks on behalf of ISIS in their own countries. We've just read about further cases involving very young boys in Australia over these last few days. Closer to home, race and religion are sensitive issues for many of our neighbors. In Malaysia, there are tensions between Muslims and non-Muslims over the use of the word Allah by Christians and over the introduction of hudud punishments under Islamic law. In Indonesia, there are from time to time tensions between different religious groups, like Sunni Muslims, with the Shia Muslims, with the Ahmadiyyas, with the Christians, or with the Hindus. Race and religious tensions are worsened when they are exploited for political motives, and we need to watch these external developments very carefully. There are also developments within our own society that can affect our racial and religious harmony. For one, Singaporeans are becoming more religious and taking their faiths more seriously. This is in itself positive, because religious faiths are strong anchors for good morals and caring communities. But religious fervor can also lead to separation and mutual exclusion between different groups. And people's social circles can shrink down to only their own group, leading to less mixing between different faiths. And people may feel less respect and tolerance for other groups and may proselytize more aggressively, offending others. So we must temper growing religiosity with greater tolerance, mutual understanding, and respect. And here, organizations like the IRO can play an important role. Secondly, the internet and social media have made it easier for people both to cause offence and to take offence. When someone puts up something provocative or offensive, it doesn't just affect the coffee shop in which you let off steam, it reaches the whole of cyberspace. May we even stretch beyond Singapore if it goes viral. And one thoughtless comment can cause a mass reaction. But instead of a judicious response, it may provoke a self-righteous mob reaction and a public lynching, which is even worse than the original provocation. Thirdly, as our society develops and becomes more diverse from time to time, religious issues will overlap with social and moral questions. For example, LGBT issues or dealing with income inequality. On such issues, religious groups will have their views, and yet they are not just religious issues because they are also subjects of public policy or social policy. And also there are contentious issues where achieving consensus will be elusive. 
in such an environment to maintain harmony in our multiracial and multireligious society, the government must take a watchful, prudent, and hands-on approach. It's got to be neutral, it's got to be secular in its approach, and it's got to be pragmatic in solving problems. We can't afford to take purist notions on freedom of expression or the right to be offensive to others. So we will not hesitate to act firmly when necessary, because if conflict erupts, it will cause grave damage to our social fabric. Our limits may be stricter than some other societies, but we make no apology for that. It is because of the nature of our society and the different faiths which have been brought together here and which must live peacefully together here. And we should not change our fundamental policies that have served Singapore well in our unique situation. The Pew Research Centre ranks Singapore as the most religiously diverse country in the world. But we are also one of the most harmonious in terms of inter-religious relations, and not by chance. It's happened because we have firmly prevented conflicts from escalating and polarizing our society, and because we've had responsible and enlightened religious leaders of all faiths, so that when we encounter differences, everyone understands what is at stake and we can work things out. Many years ago, in October 1972, President Benjamin Shears opened a seminar jointly organized by the Interreligious Organization. And he said, tolerance can be based on ignorance and lack of interest, but an active tolerance seeks what there is in common, though words and rituals or architecture may differ. And that remains true today. Today, our religious leaders understand that if we choose to focus on our differences and refuse to find common ground, we will all be in trouble. So I'm heartened that the younger IRO leaders are continuing this legacy of focusing on the common ground and practicing active tolerance. They are setting up the IRO Harmony in Diversity Museum. The museum will display artifacts which focus on the commonalities across religions and they will work with schools to incorporate the museum as part of learning journeys for students. And they are planning to work with scholars, including from the SIS Studies in Interreligious Relations in Plural Societies program, to build up a knowledge repository of the different faiths in Singapore. It will be a focal point for our younger generation to learn about religious harmony and to imbue in them the spirit of give and take. I fully support this effort and I urge you also to help it to succeed. Finally, once again, may I thank the IRO, IRO for your service and for the important role that you've played over the last 66 years. May you remain steadfast and successful in your efforts and continue to play an important, constructive role in Singapore. Thank you very much. Thank you, PM Lee.